I decided to talk about uh, venous problem. The varicose vein or chronic venous insufficiency, not too many people talk about it. It's not very well known in the community. Everybody talk about the arterial disease uh, because it caused pain, symptomatic, gangrene, ulcer, amputation. But the, the very few people either talk about venous vein disease or uh, know how to manage it. And interestingly enough, it's one of the most common disease in human beings. It's much more common than coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease. As, I, as you will see, that 50% uh, of the women in their lifetime will have some kind of varicose vein, either spiral vein, reticular vein, or full-blown varicose vein. So this is not uncommon, and it can cause major problems. So we'll go with the uh, superficial venous problem, we we'll go into the deep venous problem, and then we go into the uh, disaster or the nightmare of the venous problem, which is venous ulcer, where you see the wound care doctor uh, struggling to take care of the wound care patient, chronic wound patient. And chronic wound patients are there forever. Their healing process is slow. And it makes a lot of professionals disabled. I, I know personally a professor from a and who was only 56 years old applied for disability because he had a chronic venous ulcer in his legs. He cannot do his job, he cannot do normal function, <coughs> and he has to force himself to probably retire because of the chronic venous disease. So that kind of uh, disability you're dealing with. So uh, chronic uh, venous insufficiency uh, is the uh, basically a systemic venous hyper, hypertension, either due to the valve damage or due to obstruction or thrombus. But in any case, the common uh, denominator is the venous hypertension, which lead to blood vessel engorgement and you see the visibility of the vein there. Uh, greater saphenous vein, then you have uh, below the knee uh, small saphenous vein, and then you have a deep vein. All the deep veins are goes with the arteries. So popliteal artery, we have a popliteal vein. Below the knee, each artery has two veins. So posterior tibial artery followed by two posterior tibial veins, anterior tibial artery followed by two anterior tibial veins. But above the knee, they, then they have a single deep uh, common femoral vein. And you look at the cause of uh, varicosity or venous chronic insufficiency is the damage to the valve. So the venous uh, vessel are supplied by the one-way valve where uh, you see that the blood can only go upward into the heart. It doesn't go uh, beyond that. And so prevention of this is by this one-way valve. Some people are prone to have a damage to the valve. Uh, it's mostly genetically determined uh, most of the time. Um, it runs in the family, like I have in my family. So I have some varicosities of my own. And uh, they start developing it. And especially those people who are, have a job where they stand a lot. Like I work in cat lab, some people work in bank, standing all day, or some people are doing access, uh, work which require increased abdominal pressure. So whatever it takes, it, they have uh, damage to the valve and cause uh, venous insufficiency. So the risk factors are, I said genetic, is more common in female, uh, most likely either related to the hormones, and it's more common after pregnancy. So they not, may not have anything, but after pregnancy, they start seeing some initial reticular vein and uh, then eventually full-blown varicose vein. So the pregnancy is a risk factor. More children, more chance of having a, a more varicose vein or, or progression of diseases get worse and worse. Um, so the other risk factor, um, 
is the uh, prolonged standing. It's more common in older patients and it's more common in obese patients, as we say, have a higher pressure. If you look at the signs and symptoms, initially they are presented with just the achiness, heaviness in their legs. They don't know. They don't know why their legs are heavy. Feel heavy. They're okay otherwise. Uh, no claudication, no other thing. Was just heavy, especially at the end of the day. They, their legs get early get fatigued, and at the end of the day, they get some swelling in their ankle. Common finding. A lot of women will tell you, at the end of the day, I have a swelling in my legs. I don't know why, especially when I fly. And I, I don't have a hypertension, I don't have a heart disease, I, I don't eat too much salt, I don't know why it's happening. So now they know why it's happening. Itching, they can have a little bit more itching and they think there's a dryness there. The restless leg syndrome is very common. Some people talk about what happens when you, you have a pain at rest while you're sleeping or a spasm in your legs at night, or, or, or this kind of symptom. This is typically happened to people with the um, uh, varicose vein. The restless syndrome, the two most common causes are either varicose vein or sleep apnea. This is the most common reason. So you need to rule out these two diseases before you give them a medication, because we, are, we jump on giving them medication for rest leg syndrome, but we need to find out why they have a restless leg syndrome. Sleep apnea, very good. And uh, cramps. So somebody have a cramps at rest, it's the most common reason for them, have a uh, very good. Vein. So the management, we'll, we'll talk about superficial vein, then we'll talk about the deep vein. So if you look at the uh, superficial vein uh, diagnosis, the major, uh, goal uh, of diagnosis is to find out where the reflux is, where, which valve is damaged. And the best way to do it is the ultrasound. How you fix them? Uh, number one method or the most conservative method of treating is, is to do uh, providing a stocking. A stocking will give you enough uh, pressure uh, and re uh, reduce uh, the, the pressure within the vessels and increase the venous return and re reduce the symptoms. The problem is not too many people are compliant with this stocking. You have to wear it every day, especially when you're working, you're standing, you're playing, you have to wear it every day, otherwise it will not be effective. And some, it's not easy to put it on, especially high pressure uh, stocking. It is a piece of work. When I, my mother asked me to put it on the other day, I was sweating. <laughs> so that's the another reason people don't use it. It is just like a not easy thing to do. So um, then we we go for the treatment to make sure uh, take care of the problem. If they have a, a reticular vein or a spider vein or a small veins, we do a, either laser or radio frequency ablation to take care of them. So if you look at the stocking. Typically, we use a different pressure, mild, moderate, severe. Uh, the, the mildest pressure is 10 to 20 mmHg, which you uh, use for the initial symptoms, which is the lightest one. And they also come in a sports uh, uh, style. You don't have to have this kind of a boring stocking. If you go to a different website, you have a colorful, sports-looking uh, stocking, which you use for, for people who exercise or Bicycling. This is the uh, foam sclerotherapy. We use a, a insulin type needle and we use a sclerosing agent, polydocanol, and uh, it's uh, foamed so it, it uh, absorbs better. And um, uh, you use the very thin needles to introduce it, and um, you're done in five minutes. So all the um, reticular spider vein can be treated with this simply. Uh, very minimal. Min no pain at all, and within within six weeks they disappear. But anybody who has this, we want to make sure they don't have any bigger vessel reflexes because invariably they have bigger vein problem too. So we always also sound to make sure they don't have a deep problem because if they have a deep problem, they will come back. The pressure is there, so you're not taking care of the main problem. So.
So, and sometimes you have bigger uh, superficial vein, then you can use the ultrasound to guide your uh, access, and you can do the ultrasound guidance, uh, sclerosing agent, and take care of it. But if you have a bigger veins, very, uh, regular uh, garden variety uh, GSV, you see it, then you use the ablation procedure. So historically, what we used to do, there was no ablation, there was no laser or radio frequency ablation. There was a stripping. A stripping uh, was very painful. People who have a stripping done still remember even if it was 50 years. They will not remember their pregnancy, they will remember stripping. <laughs> it was so painful. And this was like a nightmare if they remove it. Uh, uh, no matter how much sedation you give, post procedure was painful also. So um, here come uh, ablation procedure. The ablation procedure is basically accessing, create, accessing the veins, establishing an IV, and then use a special catheter. Just go into the uh, vessel and either have a laser or radio frequency ablation to desiccate the whole vessel close the whole vessel. And that takes about 15, 20 minutes to do the procedures done in an office, like I've been doing in an office for the last 10 years. Um, and we, we numb the entire area so there is no pain during the procedure. And uh, after the procedure, we, we provide them a stocking for a few weeks. And within four weeks, you'll see that everything shrink and then the smaller veins start shrinking too. So even if you don't treat the smaller vein, if you treat the bigger vein, they're all going to start shrinking. And if some of them is still left over, you can do the foam scleral to take care of that. So procedure become very simple and is approved by insurance. But insurance wants you to have a stocking, apply first, give a try. If it doesn't work, then you call them, and then they will approve the procedure. So it's, so it's medically approved procedure for that reason. So if you look at the initial varicose vein before the radio frequency ablation, and this is after. So it's a very successful procedure. Uh, is we, we help a lot of people. We do like 15, 20 a week. And uh, it's very gratifying to see the result like this. Uh, if you look at the deep vein system, that's a difficult one. Where you see uh, all the patients have a DVT, uh, and all have um, um, clotting system and have a chronic venous problem which lead to a lower extremity swelling. How I got into this one? Well, um, when I was looking uh, at, um, I see a lot of consult uh, in, in the beginning of my uh, cardiology practice. People send me uh, patients with a lower extremity swelling to rule out cardiac disease. Well, patient come with a two plus edema, uh, typically uh, middle aged or young female. We did all the cardiac workup, echocardiogram, stress test, everything. Nothing I can find out to explain the lower extremity edema. I even didn't know myself what I'm dealing with. So I'm just keep going to different conferences, and then finally, it, after a few talks, it dawned on me that it's not cardiac, it is the venous problem. And until you know about the venous problem, you're not going to treat it. And some of them are put on high dose of furosemide or Lasix, end up having a kidney damage and come with a creatinine of 2.5. And, and they still have a swelling. So this is the common scenario you see in the hospital. People come with a swelling and their EF is normal. This is chronic venous insufficiency. And the nurses, the one first need to recognize is on the floor that it's not going to happen. So the cause is different. The uh, very common cause is the primary cause. And I'll tell you, if you just watch, what, uh, if you watch the people come to your hospital with DVT, they're going to have more left DVT than the right. I can bet you you're going to find it. So if you see a DVT on the left side of the leg, then you're going to know what it is from today. Uh-huh. I know why, why a patient have a left-sided DVT. It's very common to have a DVT on the left side. I have a patient who I just did the angiogram last week. She have a left-side DVT five times, and she's only 52 years old. 
and nobody is looking into to find out why she's having DVT on the one side. I mean, they did a hyperglobal state with no result. So the reason is they have a congenital problem or a common problem is called Maytherno syndrome. How many people heard of this syndrome? This one, probably because she worked with the venous disease. This is the most common reason you get blood clot. What happened is the, the artery, the right iliac artery, overlying the left common iliac vein and compressing it. It's more common again in female with the structure. And so the vessel compressed most of the time have created inside a little web. So, but it doesn't lead to uh, DVT alone. They have to have other risk factors like prolonged bed rest, surgery, all those things. So why somebody get the DVT with a with long surgery or knee surgery and why the other one don't get it? You never ask that question because of this, not because of the hypercoagulable state. You both can have a hypercoagulable state. If one doesn't have this, they're not going to have a DVT. So this, this thing is very unrecognized, unknown in the medical community. That's why we're discussing this. So this is the most common cause of uh, creating a trouble with no obvious reason. And we're seeing more and more of those. I've, I've treated in this hospital four or five of those female with a chronic uh, leg, unilateral leg swelling, and nobody can help them. And we found this problem. So if you look at the uh, Maytherno syndrome, and uh, some people try to find out if how common this Maytherno syndrome is. And they look at the uh, MRI vascular studies venogram, and they found that the, uh, the incidence of uh, uh, compression of the left iliac vein is very common. Almost 50, 60 percent patient population have this kind of a problem. But not all of them get DVT. They have to have a other risk factor developed with it to get the things. Um, and more commonly, if they develop a DVT, they're going to have a chronic venous insufficiency, post-thrombotic syndrome, persistent swelling, and eventually lead to ulcer. So venous ulcer, when you see a patient with venous ulcer, especially on the one side, and not the other side, you always think of methanol syndrome. You have, and, and the diagnosis is not easy. I mean, ultrasound will not help you. Ultrasound doesn't go enough to uh, in the equation to make a diagnosis. The CT venogram, MRI venogram, they can be helpful, but not everybody does this one routinely. So if you ask the radiologist, he's going to think twice, OK, how, how I'm going to do it? Where's my protocol? I need to pull some files. So it's not a routine procedure to be done. And so the only way you can diagnose this thing is to do venogram. And not only venogram, but you have to do intravascular ultrasound along with the venogram to make a diagnosis. So we do it all here, but we will learn this uh, hard way that the venogram alone will not be enough to, to make this diagnosis. So if you look at the ultrasound, we, we're going inside both legs. This is your right common iliac vein. Look at the lumen. And this is left common iliac vein, right where it become an IVC. An angiogram, it doesn't look that bad. Here it looks like a 70, 80% block. And that patient have a left leg persistent swelling, nobody can treat it. We fix it with the stent. This is the lesion. You see it commonly. And you can see it developing a collaterals because of that. And we fix with the wall stand. Now the swelling is gone. Patient come to me with the swelling symptom of four or five years, coming from different state, went to a, a leading vascular surgeon. They said, no, we, cannot, we don't know what it is. We cannot treat you for this. But this is unrecognized. So common, so ignored. So if you look at the other causes, the most common cause is DVT, deep vein thrombosis. 
Um, the, this is, we know, one of the reasons is maintenance syndrome, the other reason is risk factor. Those people who have older age, uh, as we discussed before, Dr. Singh, smoking is a risk factor. Prior DVT is a risk factor. Um, anything which slow the heart flow, congestive heart failure, uh, obesity, sickle cell anemia, uh, injury to the blood uh, vessel due to chronic uh, uh, catheter there, uh, all can lead to um, problem. Hyperpoglobal state, uh, factor five is the most common disorder here. Um, in um, immobilization, uh, some medication therapy can lead to DVT. We know oral contraceptives are very well known for this. Um, then heparin induced uh, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia is the leading factor. People with nephrotic syndrome or the nephrotic kidney disease have a hyperpoglobal state that can have a DVT. And DVT, as you, as you we know, is very common here. We, we see it all the time. But what do we do with the DVT? Nothing. We do conservative treatment. We give them heparin and coumarin and send them home. It doesn't solve the problem. You didn't fix the problem, you make it worse. And we still do it the, the, nowadays, in, in 2015. And that leads to a what? Damage to the valve, post-thrombotic syndrome, chronic venous insufficiency, uh, swelling, and, and the patient eventually sent to the wound care center. Because your treatment is not right. You're not solving the problem. The big clot is still there, is going to organize and cause all the problems. So, uh, so they have a partial recarinization and uh, still have a residual thrombus. Uh, eventually lead to a majority of the people, 70% of those people at seven, eight, seven years, going to have uh, definitely post thrombotic syndrome and they have a big iliofemoral DVT. And they all end up going to the wound care center. So this is the root cause which not been addressed as much as we addressing the wound itself. And that's why we're trying to develop a program here to look into the root cause and treat them aggressively from the very beginning. Like patient come to us in ER with acute uh, thrombosis, instead of just giving them Coumadin, remove their clot. And removing the clot is fairly easy procedure nowadays. It used to be a difficult one. We'll discuss how we do it now here. So if you look at the pathophysiology of uh, post-thrombotic syndrome, uh, they develop uh, severe symptom, scarring, damage to the valve, um, and eventually leads to a permanent disability. This is one of the major reasons people apply for disability uh, in a younger age is the uh, DVT. So how do you prevent the post-thrombotic syndrome? As I said, the heparin coumadin doesn't prevent post-thrombotic syndrome. The only way you can rem uh, do it by actual removal of this clot within the first two, three weeks. It's just like, what do you do when patients come with a heart attack? They have a blood clot in their coronary arteries. The, the muscle is crying in chest pain. You call the STEMI team, the surgeon on call, wake up 2 o'clock in the morning and come and clean it. What do you do with your DVT when you, the whole leg is compromising? You start in a heparin, call a doctor to come in the morning, see in the morning. So we be discriminating here between the organs. So if you look at the uh, method of removing the clot, it used to be that we don't know how to effectively resolve the clot. We used to do a thrombolysis. When you used to do thrombolysis, it was a very tedious, very prolonged procedure. Take about 24 hours of using a TPA, bleeding everywhere. You have to check PT, PTT. It was a nightmare of the nurses to do a thrombolysis. So that's why nobody want to do it in the long run. So we found that if we, we work with lytic plus we do a mechanical thrombectomy, 
or removal of it, we can, we can do a better job. So we come up with a protocol where we use a, a aspiration catheter we call NG jet. I think Dr. Reddy uh, will talk about briefly on, on this device. Uh, this device is pushing the saline and breaking the uh, uh, clot and removing the clot at the same time. And before we do that, we introduce a catheter to give a, a lytic, like a TPA or TNK locally, and, and, and wait for a couple hours before we do this procedure. So we introduce the uh, uh, TPA locally to make sure it absorbs into the clot uh, for two hours. Then we go there, you can easily suck all the clot. But the key is you have to do it in first two, three weeks. If you come late, you cannot remove all the clot. So the, the, the success is dependent on the timing. So you can see here, there's a clot here. You're doing a thrombectomy, angioplasty, and you have to do invariably some angioplasty stenting there down the road. So the benefit you get from that uh, new paradigm, which we're doing here, uh, hopefully pe more people will be convinced to refer to us to do this. Uh, it, you resolve the symptom very quickly. They go home next day. As you saw from Dr. Abrol talk, uh, Dr. Henderson was saying, Aliquas work in, within four hours. If somebody come with a DVT and we remove the clot and we give them Aliquas, technically after four hours they're ready to go. They're fully anticoagulated. So paradigm is shifting. Instead of, you, there used to be this DVT patient we used to pamper them for seven days, eight days, just because the Coumadin INR therapeutic is not achieving, and, and you're keeping them for one week. They come to you, you treat them in the morning, next day, uh, they are on two, three doses of aliquis, they go on. And uh, not only this, but you're reducing the chance of uh, uh, stroke, uh, much shorter hospital stay, and uh, long-term damage has been spared. So this is the, the new way of treating uh, our DVT. And we talked to uh, our uh, ER colleague, we are trying to educate people that when the DVT people come to you, don't sit on them and just call us. We don't have to do it same day, we can do next day, but it has to be done in next few days to take care of those people. So hopefully you'll take a home message that anybody come with a DVT, just don't sit on it with happily and ask your physician, what are you doing for this clot? Are you removing it or are you going to sit on it? I'll just send them on Coumadin. So what happens if you don't treat them? That's the nightmare of your post-thrombotic syndrome, chronic ulcer. That's the main problem. And um, when this happened, the healing is slow. We found is anybody who has venous ulcer, they have a post-thrombotic syndrome for sure. Either they have a clot, which is obvious, if it's up to inguinal ligament. If they have a clot, which is not obvious, if it's a pelvic DVT, 90% of the time you don't know if they have a clot. So you just assume they're gonna have a clot uh, they already had a clot there, which reorganized, causing the valve damage, or it combined with Methanol syndrome. So whatever the etiology is, it damaged the valve, and invariably they have a chronic inflammation and inflammatory process lead to iliac vein stenosis. And we found that if you fix their iliac vein stenosis, you may not prevent venous reflux, but you can prevent progression of the ulcer and the healing get much faster. So if you combine uh, stocking or compression with the stenting, majority of those people will heal within three months. And this is, we just now know for the last few years. Before we don't know how to treat them. And the only way you can find it if, you, if the right doctor knows who to refer to the right doctor and that, that doctor know how to treat it. 
So it has to be a combination of from both ends. That who, who to refer to and what to do with it. And again, they all require venogram with in IVAS. Without IVAS, forget about it. I used to do the uh, venogram on those people without IVAS, my personal experience. And I dismissed a lot of patients five years ago. I didn't see any lesion. And now I regret. Because all of them have a lesion, I just didn't do the right thing. So we always do the IVAS now. We learned our lesson. So in conclusion, uh, chronic venous disease is a very common clinical condition. It presents with different variation of, of symptoms, started with the spider vein, go all the way up to the ulcer. So it has a wide spectrum of disease. If you don't hit it at the beginning, you're going to see a problem down the road. Uh, early recognition of chronic venous insufficiency by PCP. Primary care physician need to start looking at the legs, not the face. Give some time and talk to them. If they don't, you ask them, can you look at my leg and see what's going on here? Force them to think about it. Uh, wound care center should be equipped with the diagnostic tools. And they need to know what to the right test we need to do. Most of the time I see in the wound care, they do a venous test. They don't see any DVT. They see a little bit of reflux. That's the end of the story. They don't know what to do otherwise. All venous ulcer need to be sent to endovascular interventionists for the venogram, no matter what. Period. There's no other way. That's the only way you can make a difference. And if you don't do the venogram, you're never going to find it. So just a simple deep vein ultrasound to rule out DVT is no role, has no role in venous ulcer. No role. So uh, the right treatment for the right option is the best thing. Thank you.